Greetings, Delvers. Welcome back to the Vaults for Master. Today, we're going to continue our deep, deep, deep dive into method strategies that you, the GM, can use in your game, whatever that is. In my case, it's a homebrew, sub-training, dark lands, under dark style of setting. And figured out ways to increase the engagement of your players in this story. And you're going to be using their characters' backstories to do this. And we're talking about 10 strategies today, number eight. We're going to be looking for thematic resonance. Hey, what's that? It's not some sort of physics concept. Not really, but resonance sort of means you got some sort of source of energy vibration over here. And that energy travels over here and causes some other location to vibrate at the same frequency type of concept uh the way you might think about this in sort of plain layman's terms you got that dude rolling down the street right and they got their big old bass kicker box in the trunk and it's boo, 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 and your windows are starting to vibrate boo, boo. that's resonance right you got that source of energy over here and it's vibrating over here now in game terms, in design terms, strategy terms, we're talking about using the theme of your story to resonate over here with the theme of your characters. The big idea, right? The theme, the, the concepts you're pursuing. So let's get into this and talk about it. Seeking thematic resonance. All right, what is this strategy? As I indicated, you're going to be trying to harness the power of thematic echoes. Uh, between your main plot, so what's going on in the main story, this theme that you have. In my game world, we're talking about uh, chaos, destruction, anarchy, you know, obliteration on one side, total freedom, entropy maybe, I don't know. And then on the other side, you've got um, structure, law, order, tyranny, enslavement you know, extremism, that sort of thing. You've got these two forces in opposition to each other struggling in their cosmic battle for control of the universe. Who's going to win? That's what the story is about. The characters are injected into this. So we've got this major theme going on, and then we have the characters, these little people in this grand cosmic scale. What are their backstories? The two of those things need to resonate with each other. So the theme of the game needs to resonate with their backstories. And this is what, in my opinion, makes this probably the hardest strategy to pull off because it requires a huge level of cooperation by your players because their characters need to be matching theme. All right, let's continue. Explanation. Uh, you want to express the theme of your game in lots of different forms, whether it's, you know, that session you got coming up, the quest the players are going on, the way uh, the big bad evil guy acts, whatever that case may be, it needs to express this theme that you have, whatever your theme is. And if you're not sure, well, hey, what are themes, what kind of themes are available to me, you can always Google, you know, common themes in literature. You know, I think I found a list of like 20 themes, and, you know, man versus machine, man versus nature good versus evil, those central overlaying themes, concepts, ideas that you are pursuing. Also, uh, if you're going to be using this strategy, the reason here is because it's going to create a unified story uh, where your campaign and the personal themes of the characters reinforce one another. So the, th the campaign has its, its concept, its idea, and the characters have their ideas and the two of them are going to be uh, reverberating back and forth they're going to resonate with one another so as one thing starts to give off energy vibration it's going to cause a an identical echoing vibration on the other side of the equation so you got the plot could be triggering the characters the characters could be resonating the plot all right application you know where and when are you going to be using this strategy well if you're trying to create a unified narrative now, here's where it gets tricky. Here's why I think it's it's tough. Because you need to identify and integrate the theme that resonates across both your plot and the personal stories of the characters. And as the GM, you really only have control over one half of this equation. You are in charge of what the main plot is, what the main story is. You are in charge of what the theme is for the game, right? I was the one who chose chaos versus order my character my players didn't pick that i picked it but then on the other side of the equation you've got your players they're creating characters 
And your characters, if you want to get the strategy to work, they too need to reflect this concept of chaos and order. So your characters, as they're being created, they need to have elements of this struggle. Each character needs to kind of represent both sides of this coin between these two forces. And the struggle that they go through is, well, which side do they pick or which side do they support? Or are they going to try to, to maintain a, a middle road? Right. So your characters need to be designed around this concept. And this is where I think and give a shout out to, um, you know, Paizo, who makes the Pathfinder products. And I'm not trying to sell you on the game. You all can play whatever game you want. But as an example of this, uh, in a published system, you have the, let me pull this up for you. Pathfinder has these adventure paths, right? There have these um, published published resources that they, you know, games, right? Modules, whatever you want to call them. And example here is from the Outlaws of Ulkenstar, a three-part adventure path that takes your characters from like levels one to ten or something like that. And for each of their adventure paths, they put out these player guides. Now, why is this important? Well, if you look at the adventure paths and these free downloadable player guides, what they always do is they put a section in here that advises the players, because these are designed for players, not the GM, but for the players. And it talks about your character. And it tells you exactly what the theme is and what your character should be built around in order to enjoy the game and fit the theme. So here it says, in the Outlaws of Ulkenstar Adventure Path, you and your friends assume the roles of wanted criminals who must operate outside the law to earn their fortunes and freedom. Your ultimate goal is twofold, clear your name and also seek revenge against the villain responsible for your ruined reputation. The end, end of story. You want to play this adventure path? You want to be a player? You need to create a character that fits that theme. You can't create a character. I mean, I suppose you could, but if you create some character that doesn't fit the theme, well, then you're not going to have fun. And the GM, you're going to be like trying to trying to pound this square peg in the round hole. And this, my friends, I think is a major problem. If you ever hear any of these horror stories about people who have, uh, you know, terrible game sessions. Uh, and people are talking about like murder hoboing in their, their fantasy game where they've got, for some reason, the characters decide to murder all the, 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 the villagers or they go into the shop and they don't like the price of some, you know, healing potion. So they murder, murder the salesman and steal everything. And you're like building a game that the theme is, you know, the good guys are supposed to be riding unicorns and blasting the enemy with rainbows. And meanwhile, they're murdering people in the village. Like what is going on? They have characters that don't fit your theme. That's the problem. So you really need to get the buy-in from your characters to join the story, right? You need to tell them what the theme is. In my game, my theme, like I said, chaos versus order. And on top of that, my players understood from, you know, session zero, you are a refugee. You have level zero. You don't have any powers. And for some reason you decide to step forward to assist the caravan of refugees which gets stuck behind a you know collapsed tunnel in my my dark lands under you know underworld uh scenario setting here and you decide to to scout out a way around this blockage for some reason whatever your reasons are that's up to your character but that is what the game is starting with that is the theme go and my characters or my players know this so they create characters that are refugees that are gonna try to save this caravan and then of course things start to you know expand and, and snowball from there so if you get a character or a player who joins your game and doesn't want to do that or refuses or creates characters that don't fit well then the solution is you kick them i'm sorry okay i don't care if they're your big best buddy from kindergarten they're not following what you're setting up so you've got to make this clear and they need to buy in that to me is why this is a difficult challenging strategy because you need to work with them and they need to work with you and sometimes people don't want to do that so we're creating a unified narrative another reason or another method that you're going to use as far as applying this you're trying to create this deepened engagement so the idea here and this is why you're you're hopefully your players buy into this is that if their character they create has the same struggle as the story has then they're going to be more deeply engaged because the struggle their character goes through 
is mirrored by the struggle the story goes through and vice versa. So when one thing is resonating in this battle between chaos and order, it's going to have an echo effect over here on my player characters. And if my player characters are struggling with this fight between these two powers, or they decide to ally with one side over the other and try to swing the pendulum in that direction, well, then that is going to resonate over here with my main plot. And so the two things go hand in hand. They're synergizing with each other, right? This is the idea here. We're trying to create this resonance. Energy applied over here, let's say in your plot, is causing energy over here in the player characters. And the characters, energy that they're given off, is over here and vibrating and triggering your plot. It's a beautiful scenario. But again, buy-in is everything. Implementation, how do you go about doing this? Well, let's talk about this. Common themes, I've already mentioned this. You need to identify the overarching theme. Like, what is your story about? Okay, you need to know that. And then the second thing is, what are some ways in which that theme is mirrored or explored within the character's backstories? So as your players are making their characters, you should have the session zero thing, or you should give them, give them that, you know, uh, Outlaws of Alkan Star player guide, you know, thing. Hey, here's what your character has to do, or how they fit in the story, or, you know, here's what the co concept you need to build. Whatever it is, tell them, okay? <laughs> Make them do it. Otherwise, they could come up with whatever. And by the way, let me, the little side note, tangent is, uh, this is why, especially if those of you guys who might be out there trying to find a game of your own, you know, players out there watching this, uh, and you're trying to find a game, you know, and you can't seem to get a game, and you're using, let's say, Reddit LFG channel, which, by the way, I've used and found 90% of my players through that. So I don't have a problem finding good quality long-term players using Reddit LFG channel. But the one thing from a GM side of the, uh, the coin that I've seen and why I wouldn't select a player to play in my game is because of this right here i see a lot of uh lfg posts of players going oh i've got this great idea for this character who's a you know high elf uh mercenary uh fighter who you know his mom was this uh drank super soldier serum and slayed the king of the dwarves 100 years ago and i i can't wait to play it in your game what? You don't even know what my game is. You don't know what my theme is. You don't know what my setting is. Your story is great. I love it. But if it doesn't fit my game world, I can't use you. I'm sorry. So that's another thing to think about. You know, players out there, if you are wanting to join a game, you need to be open-minded. You need to be able to work with your GM to create this character. It needs to be collaborative. Flip side of that, GMs, you can't be too dictatorial in this either. Like, you must play this. You have to play that, right? You know, you could certainly dictate that, but be aware that a lot of players aren't going to want to go with that. Like, hey, everybody needs to be an elf, and everybody needs to be a fighter, and everybody needs to be a gunslinger fighter. You know, that's great if that's your concept, and maybe you'll get some players that are going to buy into that. Cool, as long as they know up front that's what's going on. Uh, but trying to, you know, make everybody do exactly what you want, that's not going to work either. So you need to find this collaborative effort. You need to have a common theme here. So talk to the players. Look at their characters, get those backstories. I use this 18 question questionnaire I've spoken about a few times in my videos to get this information from my players. I'm also very open about what it is I want with the game. You know, I give them all the, the background information as far as setting goes and talk to them and, and communicate, right? That's the big thing here. Now, as an example or, uh, you know, a little sub example here in my game, not only is there, you know, this concept of chaos and order, this cosmic struggle. There's also a sub-theme of identity. The characters, as I said, start off as these level zero refugees. But for some reason, as I mentioned, they step forward, and the reason's their own. They step forward to, you know, kind of save the day. You know, why exactly that's up to them. But the other thing that I did as far as this identity concept goes is each character ultimately acquires this magical relic Again, I've discussed this in previous videos. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, you need to subscribe to the channel. You need to like this video. You need to notify yourself so you can get messages when I put out new ones and go back and check out some of my playlists where I was talking about my relic system that I've been using that I, I got from Pathfinder. Anyway, I digress. So the player characters, 
have acquired these relics. But why? Why them? What do the relics do? What are they supposed to do with them? Why are they getting these powerful items? Why do they step forward? You know, who are they to to suddenly be responsible for the caravan and and the the caretakers of these magic items? And what are the you know what's going on? They're trying to figure out their identity. Yeah, it's a mystery, but it's also a mystery about who they are and what they're supposed to do and what these relics mean. So identity is a huge thing. So their character backstories, that's something else I want to look at. Like, why are they here amongst this refugee caravan? How do they get started? What in their backstory would mean or explain why they maybe get this, this relic or what would they would do with this relic and how do they tie into the bigger the bigger story. So they're on sort of the self-discovery process as well. Then the other way or, uh, you know, excuse me, implementation, you know, method here is we're talking about you want to weave your themes subtly. Uh, and I've mentioned this again, a few of the other strategies that you don't want to just be bludgeoning people with uh, how you're making these strategies work. You have to have subtlety. You want to, you know, do this calmly, coolly, under the table sort of thing. And it's pretty simple, really, because you build it into the challenges that the, the, the players are going to you know face, what decisions they're going to make, what the encounters are that they're going to be facing, uh, what transformations you're planning out for the characters. As long as they're tied into your theme, whether it's identity, who am I, what am I supposed to be doing, why me, or the big cosmic theme of some of them might be representative of order, some of them might be representative of chaos, some of them might be trying to thread the needle and achieve balance, okay? Uh, and everything you're doing, you're setting up these thematic challenges to their beliefs, uh, you know, thematic encounters that parallel past experiences, thematic decisions that they have to make that are echoing the campaign's concerns. The campaign is concerned about, you know, order versus chaos. So the players are making them make choices about which side are you on? Do you embrace chaos, which maybe be under the guise of freedom? Or are you going to choose uh, a tyranny under the guise of justice, right? So I'm putting this into my game as often as I can, and the players need to uh, be modified by it, I guess. They're, you know, evolve with it. Uh, they need, they're going to be challenged by it. They have to make decisions. And the things they do then echo over in the way the plot then moves forward. Okay, because whatever decisions they make, if they decide to embrace, let's say, chaos, well, then that's going to cause chaos to ring over here. And that may advance that, uh, the agenda of those factions or big bad evil guys who are on that side. But at the same time, it's going to also then resonate with my 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 tyrants, my other my law and order factions and those big bad evil guys on the other side who then might decide to go and try to take out the characters or try to convince them that they've joined the wrong team. So this is all just echoing back and forth with uh, throughout my game. All right, let me talk about another example, a uh, specific example from my game. And I've used this character a few times now. I've talked about uh, Nezni, my uh, no longer an Orog. Okay, that was a D&D 5e concept. I have remastered her ancestry. They are now known as the Ig Ignaruk, and that is spelled right there, the Ignaruk. So with Nesni, the Ignaruk cleric, uh, she is struggling with this question of who am I? Who am I supposed to be? Uh, she was ostracized by her Ignaruk clan because she was perceived as too small, too weak, uh, couldn't keep up with the rest of the, you know, tougher, stronger of these these magmatic volcanic people who climb their their way out of the abyss itself uh, under the flaming whip, essentially, of their god Volculus and the Ignaruk. They emerge into the game world, this the subterranean vaults as as conqueror barbarian types that wanted to take over and uh, defeat their ancient enemies, the, the Droog, those uh, dwarven people who were the ones who tricked them into the depths of the pits of hell. Anyway, she was ostracized, kicked out of her clan, too weak, too soft, and she joins this cult, this Harbingers of Freedom, in the current events of the game. 
and the harbingers of freedom are on the chaos side of the equation. And so she and this cult are embodying this theme of chaos. And she is trying to become stronger, to gain power, to gain autonomy, to gain, you know, reputation so that her clan will see that they made a mistake and welcome her back as, you know, a champion. Uh, and her backstory is setting this foundation of this struggle between this imposed identity, you're weak, you're useless, and the search for, you know, who she really is and, and where she truly belongs. So she's trying to figure this out. And at the same time, the game is throwing at her these relics because her relic is the skull that whispers and talks to her. And she's hearing these voices in her head, which are apparently coming from the primordial entity that she now worships and is gaining her divine, you know, clerical powers from. So she's hearing these voices and trying to pursue them to find power, to, to achieve strength. Okay, so this is now resonating with the greater theme. So the campaign's main conflict so far is against this construct, this, this nexus creature, uh, this mechanical augmented arcano intelligence, I'm calling it. And this, this thing is uh, tr trying to impose this, its singular vision of structure and order upon the game world, assimilating the organic life forms, the humanoids, and turning them into... Uh, you know, mechanical cyborg thralls of it, drones, if you will. And this is now mirroring Nesni's rebellion against the constraints of her past. The Nexus's threat to individuality, to freedom, it's resonating here with Nesni's quest for, you know, you can't tell me who I am. I'm going to figure out my own way. I'm going to be free. So, so this is resonating with her outside of, you know, what the clan was dictating, what Nexus is dictating. She's like, no, I can do what I want to do. I'm going to follow these voices wherever they may they lead. They must lead me somewhere great. I'm going to go. Okay, so I have this, this vibration that's starting to get set up with this character. And I know all the stuff about Nessie because I've worked with the player who's created her. And uh, Alex and I have talked several times at this point. And I had made a video with Alex and I getting into... Uh, this uh, concept of Nesni joining the cult uh, a couple, it was uh, about a month ago, I think I put out a video about it. So again, like and subscribe, go check out the playlist, uh, see the Cult of Araman and uh, the uh, actionable role play that I did with Alex. There's a video about that. Uh, so anyway, we're, we're, we're taking her story and creating this unified narrative now. So as Nesni is engaging in the struggle against Nexus, uh, her personal journey of self-discovery and the fight for freedom against what Nexus is imposing upon people in the game world, that's like a central, you know, concept here. And so the alignment between, you know, what Nesni, her own personal story, and the greater story is highlighting the thematic, you know, concerns of the campaign itself. We've got chaos versus order, but as I said, Nesni is aligning with chaos, and she's growing defiance against any attempts to, you know, put people in boxes. So Nexus attempting to create this monolithic order is going to reflect that struggle uh, between those two opposing forces. Now, the sessions, the game, the campaign hasn't progressed this far yet, but this is where I see the trajectory is now heading based upon some things that not just what Nesni is doing with, you know, what Alex is doing with Nesni's character, but what her teammates are also doing. They're all, they're a pretty chaotic you know, freedom fighting bunch, uh, you know, they want to do what the hell they want to do versus, hey, Nez or, uh, Nexus is, you know, is seen as the big bad evil guy on the other side. Although I've injected a faction that actually is trying to embrace structure in order that Nexus is promising, but just that the Nexus is the extreme. And if we could just cure this, this AI of its uh, mania, which is, you know, because it's been infected with its its own parasitic type of uh, nanite, these little micro clockwork, you know, we can, if we can cleanse the Nexus, its true perfection, its true, you know, beauty will be revealed and we all should embrace that. So I've, I've put this new faction in, which of course Nesni hates, uh, and, but couple of the other party members are eh, maybe we need to embrace this so I'm, I'm creating this conflict within the party which is mirroring the conflict within the game world identity and autonomy is the other thing that's getting explored here so nexus's assimilation 
this threat is symbolic of the loss of identity. You're no longer yourself. You're a drone of this machine. Uh, and this is directly challenging the way Nesni is starting to, to have this quest of just self-defined existence. She wants to be her own person. She wants to find this, this power. She wants to gain knowledge of whatever this, this entity is that's whispering to her. And so this journey that she's undergoing now is this microcosm of the bigger battle between freedom of individuals and the campaign's world, which is swinging either way. It could be total freedom, anarchy, obliteration. Uh, if things go extremely in the chaos direction, that it's spoiler, that's a possibility. Or swing in the other direction of complete, you know, uh, justice, structure, order. We need society or tyranny, slavery, oppression. On the other, we have monolithic, uh, you're mindless thralls, drones to a singular entity on the other extreme side. And the last thing here about this unified narrative we're trying to create here with, you know, Nesni's story and her pursuit of her quest, redemption and resistance. Nesni's growth from seeking this belonging within the Harbingers to confronting uh, her own notions of strength and freedom. This is serving as narrative redemption. You know, she's she's trying to redeem in her own mind her failings as a weakling uh, and by embracing the power of, you know, this 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 primordial entity that is fueling her, she'll, she feels she'll be redeemed, right? And it's a story of resistance, not just to this external threats like Nexus, but also this internal story that she's, you know, uh, telling herself, uh, you know, and it's a fun little exploration for this character. So not only, this is kind of the cool thing. So not only is, you know, Alex having a great time with Nesni and exploring this. So my, you know, she's like all in, you know, ready to go engaged in the story which gets her excited to show up each session and, and contribute. But also this is reflecting in the main story as well because her, her allies are there along with her. They're, they're seeing this, this, this story and they themselves are having similar stories. And so everything is you know resonating and vibrating between individual uh, characters and the greater plot as well. All right, so let's get uh, wrapping this up, shall we? We're talking about what should you get out of this whole concept of thematic resonance, the strategy for getting your players engaged in your story. Well, takeaway number one, you want to craft narratives where personal and larger uh, themes are aligned, right? So what the player characters' themes are should be aligned with what your story is trying to tell. And the problem again, I mentioned this is the struggle, is you got to get this going from you know level zero on up it'll ensure narrative cohesion and it's going to elevate your story's emotional impact because what is happening in the story is resonating what's happening with the characters and what's happening with the characters is resonating over here with the story and it just makes the whole thing much more deep you know on a philosophical you know level as well identify and integrate themes into your stories the other takeaway you want to try to ensure that all the elements of your narrative are contributing to this this theme this unified exploration again in my case a major theme is order chaos freedom versus uh structure tyranny perhaps anarchy on one side suppression on the other side we're exploring this narrative and these themes they're not just you know the theme of the story but look at them as threads that are connecting the players to one another to the story itself it makes the game more complex, yes, but it also makes it more engaging because as again, as one thing happens over here, it's vibrating along these threads over here with the characters and vice versa. And the last takeaway is that this idea of thematic resonance, uh, it's a foundation that you can build your narrative on uh, and your narrative can be built emotionally resonant. So again, there's those, those struggles with your characters they are gonna resonate emotionally and they're also gonna make them thematically rich. Okay, you're gonna have a much more immersive and meaningful experience for your for your players because their characters are you know affecting the story the story's affecting them they're they're in tune with one another so if the the story is progressing towards chaos because why because the players are deciding to do chaotic things and then they're fighting against uh structure and order big bad evil guys like the nexus why because they're over here vibrating the chaos bell and ringing it had my players 
moved in the opposite direction, well, then the chaos side would be ringing and coming after them as the big bad evil guy. And that still can happen, right? Both sides are, are moving um, simultaneous to each other based upon the, the player's actions and decisions. All right, gang, that is the end of the show. So hopefully there was some useful, cool information that maybe you can put into your own game session about how to, how to create this thematic resonance uh, to get your players more engaged in your story. Like and subscribe and all that fun stuff. In the meantime, have yourselves a good day, and I will catch you on episode 9, which I forget what it's even about, but I hope it's going to be a good one. That's what it's going to be about. All right, have a good night.